Well, good morning. We have a, a nice crowd with us this morning. We're certainly thankful for your presence. It is, as you can see, a special Sunday. I feel like I'm standing in the Fortress of Solitude. But as you walk back there, you'll see just the full extent. This, this is already, you know, impressive. But as you walk down that hallway, uh, you are trans. Well, you're not transformed. You see just how much our building has been transformed. As it is every year and every year, you know, I, I wonder. My father was a, is, is a pessimist, and it, it's on me, and I, I'm naturally pessimistic. And so I always wonder and worry every year, are we going to be able to top what we did the previous time? Is it going to be okay? And every year, I am blown away. Every year, I am amazed. So if you have yet to walk down that hallway and peek into the classrooms and everything, I would very much encourage you to do that. It is, it is mesmerizing and wowing to see all the hard work. Everything you see back there, there was no fairy godmother with a wand. That was hard work, blood and sweat and toil, and, and um, uh, the good payoff is there. So go, go see it, and certainly thank everybody who was involved uh, in decorating our building. And then please come back tonight at 6.30 for the official start of the, the fun side of our vacation Bible school. And then Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, all at 6.30. Be here each of those nights. Even if you don't have children, if you don't have grandchildren, come anyway. We'll have adult classes. We'll have classes for our teens and certainly a bunch of classes for our kids as well. Invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite your worst enemies, invite everybody that you can think of to come out and enjoy what should be a great, great week. Um... We are, set, setting all that aside, we are finishing this morning a series of sermons that we began a couple of weeks ago uh, looking at a VBS song and breaking it down into three parts. But I want to begin, before we get a refresher about where we have left off in that series and what we started already, I want to begin with that text that Jesse read to us just a minute ago. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12. We're just going to start here and we're going to leave it after a minute, but I just want to begin here and just kind of lay a foundation and see how this verse kind of summarizes everything that we've been studying and are going to, going to study this morning. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3.12, the Lord make you to two things, increase and abound in love. Not just the Lord wants you to love, but however much you already are loving, because it's presumed you're loving already, but you must increase that amount of love and abound in that amount of love. So whatever level of love you're currently outputting, and it's different for everybody, whatever numerical value you assign to it, double it. And then after you've doubled it, don't rest on your laurels, it must abound, a word which means to go on top of and on top of and more and more and more. So think about how much you are loving and then love that much more and then love that much more than that. Keep constantly trying to one-up yourself to love more tomorrow than you did yesterday, to love more today than you did the day before. Continue to grow and abound, increase and abound in your love, the kind of love that they demonstrated to you, Paul says, that you must demonstrate now to everyone else. We began this series two weeks ago by talking about how we have peace like a river. That if we are God's people, we have been given a peace which passes understanding. All right, I have that peace. But that sense of contentment in me must be maintained. In fact, not just maintained, it must increase. One of the descriptions of the Messiah to come from Isaiah's vantage point, Isaiah 9, verse 7, it says that he will be a prince of peace whose peace that he brings will continually increase. In other words, if you need peace from Christ, he will never run out of peace to provide for you. The only thing that can affect your having peace is if you stop going to the well, if you stop going to the source to find peace. And when you do, you'll see he's never running out. He's increasing so that your peace can increase. But your peace must also abound. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, at the very beginning of that chapter, in the King James, there's a word that appears over and over and over. It's the word consolation, consoling, peace bringing, satisfaction providing, contentment inducing. That's all the same idea. And Paul's prayer for the Corinthian people is that feeling of contentment, that feeling of peace would abound, would grow more and more and have more and more of it. So we've got peace like a river, but we can't just be satisfied with however much peace we have. It must increase and abound. Last week, we talked about how we have joy like a fountain. And what we did as with the first sermon, we compared rivers to peace. We took a fountain and we just kind of examined what is it that makes a fountain a fountain? What are the things that a fountain needs to be a fountain? And then made those comparisons to what is it about joy that's like a fountain? 
Well, hopefully, by the end of that sermon, you committed yourself to being a person who will not just have more joy in them, but will rejoice to expel that joy out of you in word and in deed and in song. So release that joy within you. Be a rejoicing person. That joy that's in you must increase. One of the things that the Bible says, again from Isaiah, as he talks about the people who will be citizens of the Messiah's kingdom, that's you and me. In Isaiah 27 verse, uh, 29 verse 19, he says that the people who belong to the Messiah's kingdom will have joy that increases. You will have this joy within you, this feeling of satisfaction and, and delight in the Lord that will burst out of you necessarily, naturally, but also not only increase, but it must abound. As Paul tells you to make it abound in Colossians 2 verse 7. You cannot be a person who is content to have joy that just sits within you. It will wither and it will die. It must, like a fountain, burst out of you. So what do you have when you take a person who has peace like a river? What does that look like? Well, it's a very inward thing, isn't it? I have peace inside me like a river. How do you know I have peace like a river? It will come out. And it will burst out of me in joyful expression, joy like a fountain. So I've got peace like a river, and I've got joy like a fountain. But I've got one more thing to talk about. One thing that as we started with the first verse of our study, also must increase and abound. To what extent? We need to have love. To what extent? We need to be a loving people. That love must increase. How much? It must abound. How much? What's a good descriptive term? What's a good allegory? You must, I must, we must have love like an ocean. It must be humongous. And so as we've done with the past couple of sermons, we took rivers and we said, what, what do we know about rivers? We looked at the longest river. We looked at the widest river. We looked at the tallest river. And we made the comparisons to the peace which passes understanding. And as we did with last week, we looked at a fountain and we noticed the, the uh, particulars that goes into making a fountain, what all a fountain needs, and we equated that to the joy we have like a fountain. Let's make some comparisons to rivers. I want to offer just four observations, four things that we know about oceans. I said rivers, I mean oceans. Four things we know about oceans and how in knowing those things and thinking about those things, maybe our minds will start to think about, you know, it's a lot like the love that we have in God. So if possible, let's kind of just zoom out a little bit and forget about the continents and forget about the landmass and just admire and appreciate the big ball of water that is this planet. 71% water is our planet. And let's consider how our love must be not 71% of who we are, 110% of who we are. But let's take that world of ours, this big ball of oceans, and compare it to the love that we are supposed to have. Observation number one. Oceans are synonymous with the earth. You can look at telescopes, and you can look just on Google Images, and you can look at all the other planets of our solar system, and you can admire their unique beauty in each one. But earth stands alone as the little blue ball. Earth stands alone as that little ocean-filled marble in the celestial sky. Earth is the only planet that we have found that has water like this one. You can find planets that are frozen rocks and have looks like this all over the place. But ours is the only one. You've got a red planet like Mars. You've got an orange planet like Jupiter. You've got a blue planet like Neptune, but it's not blue because it has oceans. But Earth stands alone. When you think of the Earth, you think of its water and you think of its oceans. To give you a verse for context, look at Psalm chapter 24, or Psalm 24, the 24th Psalm. The first couple of verses of that Psalm. Psalm 24, the writer says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That phrase right there was a common prayer uttered by Jews when they would sit down at their dinner table and they would eat. They would have their meal in front of them, some animal and some vegetation in front of them, something that they harvest and something that they killed from this world. And they would thank God for it by recognizing the source. Where did this vegetable come from? Where did this animal come from? The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. And on that he says, the world and all that dwell therein. For he founded it upon the seas, God did. He, by earth, he doesn't mean the planet, he means the land mass. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon, the King James says floods, that just means the great bodies of water. We call them oceans. 
God took this world, and poetically it's described for us as He took the world of water, a world which was formless in Genesis 1, and He put land thereon, and all the animals therein, and man to have dominion over them. Earth is synonymous with those oceans on which God put everything else. In much the same way, Christianity must be synonymous with love. Is Christianity your religion? Are you a Christian? Then you, individual you, must be a person who loves so much, who increases and abounds in love to such a degree that when people think of you, they think that is a loving person. That's their first thought. Not your bad attitude. Not what your favorite color is, not your favorite food, not how short-tempered you may be, but they should look at you, they should think of you, they should talk about you, and they should remark, that person is really loving, considerate, compassionate, helpful, uh, you know, will jump to uh, aid a person whenever they're in need, is always thinking about other people, praying for other people, asking about checking other people. Summarize all that in a word. That is a loving person. You must be, I must be, synonymous with love that is in fact our calling listen to the master john 13 34 and 35 he says a new commandment i give you that you love one another but it's not a new commandment jesus it's that's an old commandment but that one goes all the way back to deuteronomy at least we've always been told to love each other so why is he saying it's a new commandment there are in fact two different words in the greek language translated as new there's neos and kainos Neos means a thing that is brand new, has never been seen before. It is invented from nothing. Here's a brand new thing. That's not this word. The other word is kainos. That would be how we would say something is new and improved. Like they, they, They're never going to do a better job than the Oreo, right? They're not going to perfect the Oreo. It is the Oreo. But if somehow they should come up with a better Oreo, well, they could market it as a new thing because we've already got the Oreo, but you can come up with a new and improved Oreo, and I'd buy that. A new and improved thing. You've already got a microwave, but every couple of years is a new and improved microwave. They've taken the old idea and they've put a spin on it. They've added something to it. They've made it better than it's ever been seen before. So much so that you can't help but think of it as a refreshing thing. A new thing. Jesus says, here's an old commandment that I'm going to put a new spin on. I want you to love one another. Now here's the new spin. As I have loved you. And he's about to demonstrate what that love looks like by going to the cross and dying for them, a people who are undeserving of it. So love one another as I have loved you. And by that kind of new and improved love, will everybody see that you're my disciples? If you have love one for another, that's how they'll know you belong to me. This is the way that we are seen. This is how we are identified. It is either by being a loving people or by not being a loving people. One or the other. That's how we're going to be known. I want to be known as a person. We need to be known as a congregation. The church, the kingdom must be on earth. A body synonymous with love as much as the earth is synonymous with her oceans. Observation two. The oceans of this world are in fact just one body of water united in the hydrosphere. That's the technical term for the big ball of water that we have on which the continents are around. But because those continents are so big, like you can see Africa there on the globe uh, in the corner of the screen, and to the left of it, you've got the Atlantic Ocean, and to the right of it, the Indian Ocean. You keep spinning around, you'll get the Pacific, and you keep going down, you'll get the, uh, the Antarctic. We have those different bodies of water that we've designated, but we've designated them by, with different names because there are land masses in between them to kind of differentiate them. But if you just exploded out those land masses, you would just see one big ball of water. The oceans are one body of water. In fact, your Bible even says as much. Listen to Genesis 1, starting in verse 10. God called the dry land, the ground, he called earth. And the gathering together of the waters, he called the seas. Remember that word. And God saw it was good. And then later, God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, different word, and let the fowl multiply on the earth. So God made this dry land earth, and he called the waters around the dry land the seas. And then later, he filled the waters of the seas. That second time the word is used is the way that we use the word sea. Just a big giant body of water in the middle of a landmass. Rivers are also that word used here. A pond, a lake, a stream. All those small bodies of water that we exist around are those things. He filled the earth with those things. But then 
Earlier it said that he placed the ground on the seas. That's a different word. It's a singular word. The one big ball of water. Poetically, Moses says he placed the land thereon. The earth is just one big ball of water with a bunch of land around it. In the same way, Christians are a people united in one body. And what is the unifying factor? What is the hydrosphere that unites us all? What is that one thing that makes us all one body? It is our love. Listen to Colossians 3, 12-14. Put on therefore, and then he describes who you are to put something on. He calls you the elect of God, chosen by Him, holy, set apart by Him, beloved, loved by Him. Put on, being those things, put on bowels of mercy. That feeling you have here when you see someone in need, and you feel this, oh, I need to help that person. That physical reaction of compassion. Have that, he says, and it must increase and abound. Put on within you bowels of mercy, kindness, literally usefulness. Put yourself to good use. Hold it open for somebody, and they say, thank you, kind person. That's what kindness is. It's usefulness. Put yourself to good godly use. Humbleness of mind, not thinking you're greater than others. Meekness, putting others in front of you. Long-suffering, being patient with others. Forbearing one another, putting up with others. Forgiving one another. And then he elaborates on that. If anyone has a quarrel against anybody else, remember, Christ forgave you. And the thing that you did against Christ far exceeds what this person over here did to you that you're having a hard time forgiving. Well, it'll be a lot easier to forgive them if you first of all remember that you are forgiven. And even as Christ has forgiven you, so you must forgive them. And what is, that, what is it that compels me to forgive them? What is it that compels me to be long-suffering? What is it that compels me to be merciful? What is it that makes us have all these emotions that bring us together, not pulls us apart, so that we don't quarrel with each other? What is that glue that sticks us together? What is that bond that perfectly unites us? What does he say at the end of the verse? It is a bond of love. Oh, but shouldn't it be doctrine? It should be a bond of doctrine. Well, you have to have the doctrine right. That's what Paul told you. When he commands you to be compassionate, when he commands you to be merciful, when he commands you to be forgiving, that's doctrine. But I can be as doctrinally right as I want, and if I have not love, it profits me nothing. I'll just be right, and no one will like me. I'll be right and a jerk, and no one will be compassionate to me. And I won't want to be compassionate to you. I'll know it's the right thing to do, but I won't be. The thing which drives my compassion and drives my meekness, drives my forbearance, is my love. And that's what sticks me to you. And that's what sticks you to me. We must be one body. And the thing which glues us together is our love, one for another. Like the oceans are one body, united together. Observation three out of four. The oceans influence the whole world. And what I mean by influence, I want you to think about like the moon, 250,000 miles away above us. And yet it's very small little gravitational pull greatly affects the tide. And if the moon were just a little bit closer to us, the tides would be insane. If the moon just a little bit farther away from us, our oceans would stagnate. There would be no tide. But the moon is just placed exactly where it is to have the right kind of influence on our oceans. And therefore the oceans have humongous influence on our world. And you can... It's hard for us to appreciate because we're so small and the world is so big. But if you were God and you could zoom out, you could see just the influence of the oceans over the whole world. And I have just one little verse to illustrate that. Just taken from the end of Psalm 8.8 where it references the paths of the seas. A thing which we didn't even know existed until recently. And scientists always mock the idea the Bible said there are paths of the seas. And then we suddenly found paths of the seas. And no one gave God the credit for coming up with that millennia ago. But this idea that there are paths of the seas, all I want you to take away from that is this idea that God can zoom out and see the whole of the earth and see the influence and, uh, of the whole hydrosphere, to use that previous word, of the paths that the life of the, the, uh, the Aquarian life takes as they move through the world around us and under us. The in- oceans influence everything around us. It's not just the Pacific only influences the, the uh, you know, Pacific coast. It influences and it affects all over the entire world. And so on. Listen, in the same way must Christians influence the whole world. But how do we influence the whole world? What is the way in which we are going to leave our impression? What is the stamp we're going to press on the world around us? When people see us and we are gone, what's the imprint we're going to leave behind? 
It must be our love. Listen to the text. If I can get the thing to work, there it is. Romans 13, verses 8 and 9. We're using a wrong clicker, and it's just Romans 13, 8 and 9. There it is. All right. Owe no man anything except to love one another. Get out of your debts, Paul says. Pay off your debts. Do not be indebted to anybody. If you have to have a debt to somebody, Paul says, here's the thing I want you to be indebted to them for. I want you to be constantly owing them this, your love. And through this, you will obey all the doctrine that comes with it. You'll obey all the commandments because the, the law of love fulfills everything that you're commanded to do, such as don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Don't covet. Why? You take all those commandments and you put them together. Why won't I kill somebody? Why won't I steal from somebody? Why won't I lie about somebody? Because I love somebody. You can take the command of love and sum it up all. You can take all the commands of God and sum them up in one phrase, which is love your neighbor as you love yourself. How do we show the world that we are a people who obey God? We don't do it by saying, you stay over there and watch me be obedient in my own way, in my own little sphere. You stay over there and watch me the way I sing my hymns. You stay over there and watch me the way I study the Bible. Stand over there and watch me the way I be as a Christian. You stay over there. No. You go over there and you leave your impression on them. You, you be good to them. You do good to them. So that when you do walk away from them, you walk away with them saying, that person is not like anybody I've ever met before. You leave an impression on them. And you'll do that through the love you have for them. That's your influence. Now, that's just one person. Imagine if a congregation, 300 plus in here this morning, imagine if just 300 of us did that in a town of 10,000. And that's a small percentage, but that, that's a big slice of the pie. Because if you start leaving a positive impression, you'll motivate them to want to do the same. You'll eventually bring them to Christ. And then in Christ, they will leave an impression of love. And then 300 of us can become 600 of us, can become 1,200 of us. 2,400 of us, 4,800 of us, and on and on until we've got this whole town in his hands. It's not going to happen if one of us doesn't start the ball rolling. If one of us doesn't go into it wanting to leave a positive impression through love. You are going to be given in your life every opportunity to be a jerk. Do different. Leave an impression of love and set yourself apart. The oceans influence the world. So do we but only when we love. Last observation, and then we'll be done. Our oceans are filled with mystery. We, we look up in the stars. From the beginning, humanity has looked up at the stars and marveled. Let's, let's think about how many psalms. I referenced Psalm 8 earlier. Psalm 8 is one. Psalm 19 is another one. There are so many poems in, in, written in odes to God who made the heavens and the earth. We, we naturally want to look up and gaze up and admire in astonishment those tiny little pinpricks of light in the velvety sky above and admire the cosmos. God made it. Admire it by all means. But right below your feet, all around you, are oceans that we have only just begun to understand. And we are regularly discovering new life that lives not out in outer space like Star Trek, finding new life out there and new civilizations, but we're finding new life that exists down there that we've never seen before. It's not new, but we've never seen it before that's swimming around down there. And there's some of the most beautiful and amazing things, bioluminescent looking things. They have nasty, gnarly teeth and big glowing eyes, but they're amazingly beautiful in their own little way. The oceans are filled with so much mystery. There's a great little psalm that just kind of alludes to that. Listen to Psalm 107, verse 23 and 24. The people who go and, and, you know, sail the sea on their ships and do business on the waters, merchantmen and things like that, they see the works of the Lord. They admire when they see a sunset at sea and the beauty of it. Or they look up at the starry host and admire it. Or when they wander in the deep, when they're in the middle of the ocean and they can't see anything over there, they can't see anything over there, they can see nothing all around them but just the blue. And then the night falls. And it's just this seemingly infinite void below them, this abyss of darkness and sea, and they wonder at it. They marvel at it. Our oceans are filled with mystery. Listen, when you are a people who love like God tells you to love, that means your love is not hypocritical. Your love is not circumstantial. Your love is not temporary. Your love is constant, continuous, perpetual. When you love like that, 
people will look at you funny. People who are necessarily skeptical because they don't belong to Christ. Who are necessarily cynical because they're not, they don't have the peace that passes understanding. They will see your kind of perpetual love for them and they will be suspicious of it. They will think you have an agenda. And the only agenda you have is to shine the light of the gospel and to save their soul. But they will see you as a strange thing. They will see you as a mysterious thing. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Behold His love toward us. And that we get the right to be called children of God. But the other side of that is the world doesn't know us anymore. Before we were children of God, we were children of the world. We were all together. We all thought the same way. We all acted the same way. We are all equally cynical and equally depressed and equally bitter. And then suddenly we're different now. And now the world doesn't know us. But it didn't know him either. So at least we got that going for us. One more verse. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, as sons and daughters of God. Be a follower of God. And then he says, and walk in love. Look at the wordplay by the apostle. Be a follower. What, okay, I'm following. So you're walking and I'm walking because I'm a follower. What am I walking? Where am I walking? It's not where, it's what. In what? You're walking in love because every footstep of the master is a footstep of love. And you follow in his footsteps and you go where he went to the needy, to the poor, to the sick, to the, to the enemy. And he demonstrated to them love, 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 love. So you walk in love. And that enemy will think you a strange person. That person in need will be grateful for your help and they will think it a strange thing that they got it because no one else has ever given it to them before. You will be a mystery to them. Fortunately, you can then turn around and open the Bible with them and reveal the source of that mystery to them. You can make sense that mystery to them. You can show them what you understood so they can find the source of your love and unveil that mystery that ends in Jesus Christ. Our oceans are an amazing part of God's creation. And when I think of the oceans, and hopefully now when you think of the oceans, you will think of the humongousness of God's love for you and, as he said in John 13, that same love you must reciprocate to those around you. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. Know this. Know that you are loved, but you are still condemned. And you're not condemned because you're hated. You're condemned because you hated. Because you chose not to obey God. You chose to be disobedient to God. You chose to sin against God. And yet, in spite of that, he loved you enough to send his son to die for you. And to give you the opportunity to start new. To start over. To be baptized into him, Mark 16, 16, for salvation. And then a new creation, a new person, you can go out and love as unworthily as Jesus loved you to this world around you. And maybe reach them with the same gospel that can reach you this morning. If you are a Christian, but you've fallen out of love, now is the time to come back because it may be your last opportunity. Can we help you in some way? If we can, let us know right now as we stand and sing.